Welcome, welcome, welcome to the second show of the Regina Paul Show. So today we have a special guest that is joining us shortly. Hey, her name is Kishna Jean Hine. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. You can correct me right away. And uh, there she is. Just let me bring her on. Hi, Kishna. How are you? Hi, Regina. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you are. Okay, okay great. Great. So, um, Kishna, I'm so excited to have you here with us. And I wanted just to kind of find out uh, what your story is. Like, tell us, tell us your story. Well, um, almost ten years ago, I was in an abusive relationship, um, mm -hmm. and it took me a lot to get out of that relationship. Um, that relationship did end up with me having two children, but that's about it. But once I left, um, I had to figure out how to pick up the pieces and put my life back together while still being a parent. Um, fast forward ten years later, um, I now own five businesses. Um, but I have a story to tell and I, in doing one of my businesses is having a blog, um, and a podcast. Um, and in doing the blog and the podcast, I had a lot of people reach out to me and tell me that my, my story was inspiring to them. Like how I was able to come out of what I came out of and still be okay and still be a good mother and still have all these different things was inspirational to them. And it kind of led me to think that you know, I have this gift that I can give to people. I can help people come out of the same situation that I came out of um, using tools and tricks and all that other stuff. So um, I decided to be a coach. Um, I wanted to help people who are coming out of the same situation that I was coming out of or similar situations to be able to overcome, you know, what they were going through, the mindset that they have, the trauma that they've been dealing with to be a better person overall and to be able to be good for their children if they have children. So. Wow, that's that's amazing. There's definitely a lot of uh, I, I've met a lot of women actually that have gone through relationships like that. It's crazy mm -hmm. how frequent that actually is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so how do you think your story has shaped you? I wouldn't be the person that I am today if I didn't go through those things. Um, and I know sometimes people don't understand when I say that, but in a way, I'm grateful because. It was because I went through the things that I went through, I was able to realize how strong I am and um, how resilient I am and how I can overcome diversity or overcome anything that's thrown in my way. It was because of those situations, I was able to realize who I am as a person and help me form um, my identity and let me know what I don't want in another relationship or what I don't want in life. So um, it's helped me identify who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and can you tell me a time where you just didn't really know what you were doing? <laughs> it's every day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, I own a couple of businesses. So one thing about me is I like to kind of jump in head first into doing whatever it is. I'm obviously I'm going to do like my research or whatever, but I go into lanes that I have absolutely no experience in. Um, for instance, one of my businesses is transportation. I have absolutely no experience in transportation, um, but it was a good idea. It was a problem that was presented to me and I figured out a solution to solve the problem with that company, which is why I created the company. But because I didn't have any experience in it, I went through a lot of roadblocks before I was able to get things right. I had to figure everything out on my own. Um, when I reached out to people to help me, you know, everyone was kind of like, well, you got to kind of figure it out by yourself. So. Um, it was a learning curve. It was a huge learning curve, but I learned it. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how many kids do you have? Two. I have a boy and a girl. Oh, nice. Nice. So they keep you busy, hey? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Um, so how long have you been a post-trauma coach? So I've been a business coach for the last three and a half years. Um, I just recently ventured into being a post-trauma coach. Um, because it was something that kept kind of like nagging at me, like, you need to do this, you need to do this. So I started to listen to that voice inside of me. So I, I became certified in January and I've been doing it since January. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, if money was no object, what would you do? Hmm. Business wise or personal wise? <laughs> oh, let's, let's do both. Let's do both. Um, 
if money was no object, I think I would purchase a whole bunch of house um, houses, um, renovate them and have them available for housing for um, women coming out of abusive relationships or unhealthy relationships with children and they need a place to go until they get back on their feet. Um, I would also have um, at least one of the, like two of the houses would be community centers for um, children who are runaways or children who um, have aged out of the system and have not yet been able to figure out um, where to go in life or they don't necessarily have the skills because no one wanted to pour into them. I would have two of those um, places be specifically for that. And um, personally, I think I would just travel with my kids, allow them to see the world instead of you know the state or the country, give them a yeah. different point, see how other people live in other places so that they can have um, a better understanding of what they want to do when they get older. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, so, did you say that uh, you had uh, you have five businesses, right? So, what mm -hmm. are they all? So, the one is the blogging, the coaching, the podcasting, the public speaking. Um, okay. The other one is the transportation. I am a business consultant and a grant writer, in which I do business coaching. Um, my husband and I have a drink line, and we also do. Um, real estate development wow you're a busy lady <laughs> <laughs> so so inspiring though that right? right like 10 years 10 years ago you were in a completely different situation and mm -hmm. you've just like changed your life oh mm -hmm. wow that's that's amazing wow really inspiring yeah. thank you but uh what keeps you motivated my children um knowing that they have one mentally stable parent and one not mentally stable parent <laughs> kind of makes me want to be um, intentional about making sure that they have everything that they need and they won't ever have to suffer. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you plan for like rests and self self care days? So the weekends are normally my self care days. Um, when I don't have the kids and when my husband doesn't have something planned for me, I do my very best to try to relax, recharge, get as much rest as I need. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but that's the plan. That's the intention of my weekends. And then once every quarter, my husband and I go away on vacation. So we use that as a time to recharge as well. Okay. Oh, wow. We got Kasha here that joined us. Hi, Kasha. She says their kids are motivating her as well. Do you have any questions for Kishna about uh, what she's doing? I love questions. Ask me all the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Well, we'll, ju we'll just keep going. She'll pop them up there. All right. So what advice would you give your younger self? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, and it's actually something that I've been thinking about recently. I think one thing that I would tell a very younger version of myself is to know your worth. Um, I don't think I understood the value that I held when I was younger, which is the reason why I was in the abusive relationship. Um, and I think if I knew the value that I held over myself, um, I would not be have been in that relationship and I would not have um, gone through some of the things that I have went through. So um, not just to my younger self, but to everyone, like know your worth, know your value. Yeah, that is so important. That's uh, one of the things that I teach as well, right? Like you got to know, you got to be able to love yourself first um, and to be able to take care of yourself so you can actually uh, help others do the mm -hmm. same, you know. Um, how, how I always say it is, Fill your cup first and then you can fill someone else's yeah. right it's the same same when we're going in an airplane and the and the flight attendants, attendants tell us to put the mask on our foot first mm -hmm. and then on our kids right it's mm -hmm. not the other way around we can't mm -hmm. help them if we're dead so mm -hmm. yeah totally totally get that that's uh, awesome um what is your vision for yourself in like the next five years uh and your companies <sighs> Um, in the next five years, I would like to see myself with pre-teenage children who can help me in the businesses. Um, I would like to see myself doing um, speaking engagements, more speaking engagement, um, doing workshops on or live workshops on um, 
parenting and relationships, post trauma healing, stuff like that. Um, and I would hopefully like to be making millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have like a specific uh, speaking engagement where you would love to be on like a show or a podcast or? So I, my background is working with children. Um, I am a youth development director. Um, I was a youth development director, I should say. So my ultimate like big speaking engagement would be facilitating and running workshops for youth development on healthy relationships, um, post-trauma relationships, because that's a demographic that everyone overlooks, right? When kids behave and act up, we're just like, oh, they're being bad kids without understanding that kids are not bad. Kids react to things that happen to them. So being able to facilitate, you know, multi-workshops with um, teenagers and young adults um, over, on healthy relationships, on post-trauma healing, um, on, you know, parenting, because realistically we have children who are parents. So going over parenting with them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. For me, that's my ideal um, speaking engagement. Wow, that is such a need too, to help um, help young kids who who just become parents. I know I, I was struggling. I was, uh, I had my son at a really young age and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. kind of winging it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we made it through. So that is definitely a need. Um, and even for them to know that there is something like that out there is, uh, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to tell us a story? Oh, what kind of story? <laughs> <laughs> tell us a uh, uh, tell us an experience that you've had that uh, made an, uh, a huge impact on your life. So if anyone has um, time and can go to my blog um, at balancingmyfinkids.com, you, you'll kind of see the story. Um, so one of the things that I tell people and I talk about all the time, and a lot of people don't understand why, um, that abusive relationship that I was in, um, he called the police on me and made false allegations against me and sent me to prison for nine months. While I was in prison, I was pregnant with my son. I think I was four or five months pregnant when I um, when they put me in um, and I was awaiting trial, going through my trial dates and everything. I actually gave, up, gave birth to my son in prison. I was petrified because in the prison that I was in, other women who were pregnant were, um, when it was time for them to give birth to their child, were calling the guards and the guards were not coming or taking a very long time to come and they ended up losing their baby. So oh, I was wow. petrified that this was something that would happen to me as well. Um, thank goodness, thank God that um, when it was time for me to give birth, I was also scheduled to go to court. So they were going to wake me up that morning to get me ready to take me to court and I ended up going into labor. Well, I gave labor, I gave birth to my son. Um, and less than 48 hours after I gave birth to him, they took him away from me and they shipped me back to the prison. So wow. just giving birth to this little human, I didn't even really get chance to understand and acknowledge that I just gave birth to this human. Like this human is mine, this is my human. And they took him away from me and they sent me back by myself. And at the time, he was the reason that I was holding on. Like I had to be okay because I knew that I was pregnant and I had to take care of my son. Well, when he was taken away from me, I didn't have a reason to be okay anymore. There was nothing keeping me here. There was nothing me giving me strength. I had to now figure out where that strength was gonna come from. And I told myself I have one of two choices. I can either let go and just whatever happens, happens, or I can make the decision to fight because I have now two kids that I have to try to go home for. I chose to fight. Um, and ever since that day, I've been fighting. I fight for my kids every single day. I fight for myself every single day. I fight for all of us to be good every single day. And it was in me making that decision that I started to learn my value, that I started to understand who I was, that I started to identify what I had been through and that I don't wanna go through that anymore. So that moment shaped me for forever. <laughs> wow, that's uh, that's quite the story, Krishna. Wow, I I did not know. <laughs> mm. Wow. 
that that must have been such a hard time to be away from your newborn and yeah. trying to survive being inside mm -hmm. that's that's big <clears throat> it was life changing uh, you, pardon it was life changing yeah yeah for sure um do you have someone who has been your greatest inspiration my mother um she has been my saving grace from the time that I can remember until now. Anytime that I've been in any type of situation, she's always been there. Um, she's been my mentor when I decided that I wanted to venture into business. She's been my business partner in a lot of my businesses. <laughs> she's been my partner to cry on when I was frustrated with the kids or with um, figuring out what I was gonna do in my next steps. Like she's always been there. For me, she's been my inspiration. Okay, that's awesome. That's so important to have that um, support, especially from your family in mm -hmm. such a hard time. <laughs> yeah. Um, how has your journey affected your family? Uh, that's a good question. So my immediate family stuck by me through everything, all the decisions that I made, um, me being locked up, me coming home, me deciding that I wanted to venture into business, they were always there with me, my immediate family. My extended family was kind of split down the middle because my ex was very narcissistic um, and he was a very good liar. So if you listen to him long enough, you probably would believe what he said. So half of my extended family believed me and half of my extended family believed him. Um, so that was kind of hard trying to prove myself. I felt like I always had to be in a position where I had to prove myself until I was like, listen, I'm not doing this anymore. Either, you know, you see physically what's in front of you and, you know, accept it or you don't. And once I made that decision, it made my life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, what, uh, what has been your most, uh, your favorite thing about being an entrepreneur? Because you have like five businesses, so you're busy, busy, busy. <laughs> I I love creative development. I like coming up with ideas um, to solve problems. You give me a problem, I'm going to come up with a solution to fix it. So that's the favorite part of me having these multiple businesses is because I get I have fun coming up with different ways to do different things. Um, and I like to stand out. I like to be different. I don't like to do what everyone else does. So I always try to find an angle to make what we do different than what everybody else does because in business and in grant writing, which is kind of where I got it from, um, being able to stand out makes you more, um, puts a spotlight on you. If you're not like everybody else, if you're not like the fish in the in the barrel and you're like the one jumping up, like saying, pick me, pick me, it draws more attention to you. Um, and so far it's worked in my business model. Okay. Um... So how did you, I know you said you started the uh, post-trauma coaching because of your own experience and then the um, the transport camp company because there was a problem that you solved. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with creating the other businesses? All of them were because there was a problem that needed to be solved. <laughs> <laughs> Number one thing. <laughs> So the um, the business consulting and the grant writing was because I was working with my mother. She owns a nonprofit um, and she was using a grant writer that wasn't getting her any funding. So she was like, I think you would be good at this. You're really smart. So I said, why not? I'm not doing anything. Um, so I learned how to grant write. I taught myself. I took a couple classes. Um, I did some online stuff and I just kind of threw myself into it. And within the first year, I was able to get her like $750,000. She was happy. She now she's like, everybody. Like, my daughter's a grant writer. You should call my daughter to do grant writing for you. And it kind of grew into the business consulting business. So that was that one. Um, the real estate was because we needed an office for our businesses. And I was like, well, maybe we should just purchase a building and renovate it and we can use it as office. Well, that kind of just trickled into purchasing other ones and renovating them and just using them for stuff that needed to be done. Um, and the drink line with my husband, we um, were stuck at home in COVID. And he was like, oh my gosh, the bars are closed. If I'm having trouble getting a drink, other people are having trouble getting, with, uh, getting drinks. Um, I should start a drink line. And I was like, why? 
we don't even drink in the house. He was like, yeah, but I know a lot of people who do. And I was like, okay, so let's start a drink line. And within the first month, we sold um, about $1,500 worth of drinks. Wow. Wow, nice. <laughs> Kasha says, why fit in when you were born to stand out? <laughs> yes, definitely. I've yeah. always been kind of, um, what do they call it? Um, the black sheep? Yeah. The one that's always like different and yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that was me too. Yeah. <laughs> I was always told to be nice because I was too direct. Uh, mm -hmm. Even from a young age, I was like, I don't like this. I don't need to be, you, you don't need to talk to me this way. <laughs> so they're like, Regina, you need yeah. to be nice. We have some church people coming over. Because mm -hmm. I was raised in a religious family. And I'm like, I'm always nice. I'm just very direct. <laughs> <laughs> So it just made me laugh because it was like my mom, my dad, my sister, they all would come to me like, Gina, you need to be nice. I'm like, I haven't even said anything. <laughs> I was the, always the one to question everything. I questioned everything. If the sky was blue, I questioned it. If I didn't like the way something was happening, I questioned it. And I got in trouble for it all the time. But if it doesn't make sense to me, I have to question it because naturally I'm a problem solver. So if I see a problem, I need to question why this problem is here. And that kind of is what helped me to become the problem solver. So. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, do you have like a business related book that uh, you you really love that you would like to share with the audience today? Um, uh, else, a book that I've written or a book that I've read? Uh, one that you've uh, read. Have you written one too? I've written several. So I love the 48 Laws of Power. Um, for me, I don't, it's just like everything that I need in my in like life and business is in that book. So whenever I'm struggling, I take that and I take my Bible and I go through both of them and I'm just like, yep, this is here, this is here. I can put this together and I can make it work. So for me, the 48 Laws of Power, I love that book. I feel like in every aspect of my business, it helps me. Okay, nice. Yeah, I I did read that book, I think like 10 years ago now. So I'll have to refresh, <laughs> do a refresh, refresh read on that one. I recommend it. <laughs> yeah. um, so Kasha says, no sugar coating with me. Uh, <laughs> she's very straightforward as well. Not at awesome. all. Not. We just got black sheep all around us here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, to answer your question earlier, I have, I've written two books and I'm in the process of writing two more. Um, I wrote a grant writing book to help people um, self-pace and self-teach themselves to write grants. Um, and the second one was a, a trauma healing, um, six steps to healing your trauma or over overcoming a trauma mentality after you've been in a traumatic relationship. Um, and I have that one as well. And it, I've had really good feedback on them, so I'm super excited. Right on. Um, maybe you can share the links on the bottom here no, uh, and like the comment section after the episode and uh, I'm sure people will go check it out. Yeah, most definitely. I'll put it in the comments. Okay, great. Great. Um, do you have a spirit animal? No, unfortunately no. No? <laughs> okay. Um, what is, do you have like a spiritual practice that you do? Um. I guess you can call me Christian. Okay. Um, my religious beliefs align with Christian, but I don't like titles. Um, I don't want people to say, oh, you're a Christian, so you act X, Y, and Z. I want mm -hmm. people to know that I love God um, and I believe in Jesus. And I believe that being kind to people is what we were put on this earth for. Um, and that's what I live by. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't really like labels either. Mm -hmm. Like That's really, really big. Nice. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be a good person, just be one. You know, yeah. you don't have to put a label on it. <laughs> yeah. I think being a good person is easier. It makes you happier. Um, it's less stressful than being a negative person or a bad person. Yeah, and there's definitely less pressure when uh, when you don't have that label on it as well. Right? Mm -hmm. Because then people expect you, like you were saying, expect you to uh, behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have a favorite quote that you would like to share with us? Mm. 
Yeah. Um, to love God is to know love. To know God is to know love. Sorry. Know God is to know love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, if you were to write a book about yourself, how would you name it? I think the name that I chose for my website is a good name that I would use for the book as well. So balancing life and kids. Um, Cause I feel like ever since I became a mom, that's literally all I do is figure out how to balance work life, home life, mom life, marriage life, family life. I'm always trying to figure out how to balance everything so that everybody gets enough of me and I'm not overwhelmed by pouring out into other people. So I think that that would still be the name that I picked, Balance in Life and Peace. Okay, I like that because uh, it is quite the balance, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have four, so yeah, it gets crazy. <laughs> oh, God, God bless your heart because two is like I'm pulling my hair out with only two. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how it feels sometimes too. And they're uh, all teens, so except for oh. one, getting close to it. Oh, and he was actually, uh, he told me yesterday, he's like, oh, I got kicked out of the room. I'm like, well, you know, they're all just talking about their boyfriends and their girlfriends. You're getting close to that age, and then soon they're going to be calling you in there too. <laughs> how many boys do you have? Uh, two boys oh. and two girls. Oh, I, I feel like no one prepared me for having a son. I feel like when I got pregnant and we did the ultrasound and they said you're having a boy, there should have been like, boys come with a disclaimer. Here is your disclaimer. No <laughs> one did that for me. I don't know if this is all boys or just mine, but he wakes up and his energy level is on 1000%. Oh. And he stays that way until he goes to sleep. <laughs> And we're homeschooling, so that doesn't work very well with being homeschooled. Mm. It doesn't work very well with me having meetings on the computer all day long. It doesn't work very well with his sister who just wants her peace and quiet. He's just rambunctious and he's all over the place. And I'm just like, aren't you tired? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so how has COVID affected your businesses? So everything had to get um, switched over to virtual. Everything automatically became digital. Everything automatically became virtual. For some businesses, it was fine. For um, the business consulting, it was okay. Obviously, for the the podcasting and the um, the blogging and everything, that was fine. But for the transportation, I think that was the one that took like the biggest hit because now everything is done virtually, whereas people were used to coming into the office to go to trainings, to fill out applications, to do interviews, and now we have to do all that stuff virtually. Um, and I've gotten a lot of pushback from people um, because they're not comfortable doing um, the interviews virtually, filling out the forms virtually, and I'm just like, but if it was Lyft and Uber, you would be doing the same thing. If it was another job, we would be doing the same thing. So I'm not really quite understanding why this is an issue, um, but that is an issue that I'm noticing is that in this particular business, in this particular field, that virtual transition um, was not a good one. Okay. Okay. And that, uh, sorry, which business was that for? The transportation. The transportation one. Yeah. Yeah. Were you still able to, to run though? Like, uh, because you do deliveries and all that, right? Um, so we do um, kind of like Lyft and Uber for um, anyone who is disabled or who is elderly. So okay. I'm close to them getting on public transportation or if they don't have a family member to be able to take them to like doctor's appointments, um, uh, urgent care, whatever, we come in and we provide that transportation for them. So we, when I noticed this, it was like um, a wave pattern. So in the spring and summertime, the transportation went up, but in the winter, the transportation went down. So it's like kind of a rule for to Okay, okay. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, I know in the wintertime it's the holidays. Um, people travel in the holidays. COVID spiked in the wintertime. This year we had a lot of snow, so we had a lot of snow days. 
Um, and I think it was just a combination of all these things put together, kind of put a damper on people traveling and being outside and needing the use of transportation. Okay. Um, where are you located? We're in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, what uh, do you know what your weaknesses are? My children. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I totally, yeah. 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 Our strength and our weaknesses, right? Both yeah. At the same time. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I think I care too much about other people's feelings. Not that it's a bad thing, um, but it can sometimes be a bad thing when it comes to um, business. I'm a very empathetic person um, and I'm very friendly. So if we form a close bond and now we're in business and I'm the boss and I have to reprimand you and I'm just like, I don't know how to do that now because they're such a nice person, but they're not. So that also for me is a weakness. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, where would you travel to with your family? You said if money was no object, you would just travel the world. Where's the first place you would want to go? I want to go to Italy. That's like my number one spot. I want to go to Italy. I want to eat authentic Italian food. I want to go to authentic Italian vineyards. I want to go to the countryside in Italy. I That's my first stop. Nice. And the second? Probably Colombia or Brazil. Okay, so why why Colombia? Um, the food. I'm a foodie. I like food. So I want to <laughs> eat authentic Colombian food, and then I'm the same thing for Brazil. I want to do um, try authentic Brazilian food. I also love the scenery and the culture in Brazil, so I want to be able to go see that firsthand. Oh, okay. Um, what are your hobbies outside of work? Um, planting. I love planting. I have a million plants in my house now. Um, everyone calls me the plant lady. So I love to go to the stores, get new plants, put them in the house, put them outside the house, gardening. Um, I love to read books. I love to cook. Um, one of the things that I want to do when I get older and I retire is to open up like a little beach girl and to just cook for people. Okay, yeah. What would you cook? I love pasta. <laughs> That's my <laughs> weakness, pasta. So I would probably have like a whole line of just pasta dishes. <laughs> nice. What's your uh, favorite pasta dish? Um, so we are, um, my both of my parents are Haitian, Haitian descendants. So we have this pasta dish called, um, in English, it's called macaroni au gratin. So it's um, macaroni, lunch meat, onions, peppers, um, cheese, and you mix it up. It's kind of like mac and cheese, but like with a twist, and it's amazing. It's delicious. Oh, I'm going to have to try that. I actually feel like it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Uh, now I have a recipe I can go try later today. That's great. <laughs> Haitian mac and cheese, and you'll see YouTube. YouTube has a lot of variations of it. So if you YouTube Haitian mac and cheese, you'll be able to see it. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, how would you handle a difficult client that you're working with? In coaching? Yes. <clears throat> I would have to understand why they were being difficult in order for me to understand how to deal with them. Um, and nine times out of ten, if you're being difficult in my line of coaching, it's because of the trauma that you dealt with. So I would have to understand which trauma is triggering this difficulty. Um, will help them understand and identify which trauma is triggering the difficulty so that we would be able to kind of move forward, figure out why this trauma is continuously showing up. Um, is it something about me that is making this trauma show up? Is it something that you're doing before you come to the coaching session that's making the trauma um, show up. Whatever it is, we would have to identify what that trauma trigger is so that we would be able to um, move forward, move away from it so that it won't, it, it's not something that keeps coming up. Okay. <clears throat> and um, like you said that you're also like a relationship coach, does that tie into the post-trauma coaching or is that separate? It does. So we do post-trauma relationship coaching and we just do um, general relationship coaching. Okay. 
And what are the six stages then of the, uh, I guess, healing from, from post-trauma? Well, it's more than six stages, but the six stages that I talk about in my book are, I wish I knew you were gonna ask this question. <laughs> um, the six stages that I talk about are, the first one is um, identifying your trauma. I think that is one of the biggest things is that we don't identify what it is that we're struggling with or what it is that we're dealing with or what it is that's causing us to feel how we're feeling. So identifying the trauma is one of the first, is the first stage in um, overcoming. The second one is forgiving yourself um, for being in the situation. When we are in unhealthy relationships, we tend to blame ourselves for um, what happened to us in that relationship. It's our fault. We stay too long. We love too hard. Um, mm -hmm. We should have known better. We should have listened when people were telling us X, Y, and Z. We blame ourselves for being in that situation. Um, and because we blame ourselves, it either makes us stay in that situation for longer or it delays us being able to heal. Um, so the second step is um, forgiving ourselves for being in that relationship. The third one is unlearning the trauma defenses that we've created as a result of being in that relationship. So everybody creates trauma defenses um, or everybody creates defense mechanisms, I should say. Whether or not you were in an abusive relationship, you create a defense mechanism for anything in your life that is unpleasant for you. For instance, when my kids are yelling and screaming all over the house and I need a, a peace of mind, I tune them out. That's a defense mechanism. I don't wanna hear them yelling and screaming in the house so as a result, I learned to clean them out until I hear somebody crying or until someone comes to me and goes, mommy, mommy, mommy. That's my defense mechanism. So unlearning your defense mechanisms that you created as a result of the trauma. The fourth one is identifying how those defense mechanisms change the relationships around you. Um, so for instance, I mentioned earlier, as a result of my ex being narcissistic and a very good liar, half of my family believed the stuff that he was saying and then half my family believed when I said that he's crazy and he's the problem. Um, but the ones that believed him caused us to now have um, a bad relationship because they sided with him. As a result of these defense mechanism and this trauma, I now don't have a good relationship with X, Y, and Z people in my life. Um, or as a result of um, this trauma that I went through, I might not have my kids in my life as a result of this trauma, you know, whatever. So identifying the relationships around us that were affected while we were in this um, traumatic experience or this unhealthy relationship. The fifth one is to replacing the negative defense mechanism to a positive defense mechanism so that if, God forbid, we end up being in the situation again, we now have healthy ways to deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of me tuning my children out when they're yelling and screaming in the house, I can go to them and I can say, mommy doesn't like when you guys are yelling and screaming, can you choose or can you find another way for you guys to talk to each other? So um, we're addressing now the trauma that's happening or the behavior that's happening that we are not comfortable with or that we do not like. And we are um, figuring out new healthy ways to attack that behavior so that it stops and it doesn't happen again. Um, and the last, um, the last thing is creating an action plan. Um, if you ever run into the person who abused you again, or someone who identifies with your abuser, or someone who has the same characteristics of um, an abuse that you went through in your life. So for instance, <clears throat> I still have to deal with the father of my children because he's the father of my children, even though he also is my abuser. So now that I know, you know, we have a parenting schedule, he puts the children up on the weekends and I get them back Sunday evening to go get ready for school. I have to now deal with this person every weekend. So now that I know I have to deal with this person every weekend, coming up with ways that I can avoid if he tries to attack me or um, maybe block those attacks by showing up to the meeting location with a buffer or a person who I can send out to pick up the kids and then return the kids to me so that I myself don't have to deal with that person. Whatever it is, figuring out a way to protect you so that you don't have to relive or go through that all over again. Wow. 
Wow, yeah, that is so important to have an action plan. It's crazy. Um, so you said there's actually more than just six steps. What are the other steps? How I'm many steps? On that. <laughs> um, so there's as many steps as you need. Um, the book that I wrote talked about those six different steps and how those six, six different steps are useful. But in my coaching plan, I have 12 lessons. I have 12 sessions of steps that we can take to help you um, come out of that and to build yourself up, build your defense mechanisms up, build your self-esteem up. So, you know, it kind of just depends on the person. And I have 12 in my coaching program, but another person might have 24 in their coaching program. So it kind of just depends on what approach you want to take for the person and how you are, how the trauma affected the person will depend on how many steps you need to use for that person. Okay, that makes sense. Some of us, I guess, need a little bit more time working through each each step when we to dive in deeper. Okay. Right. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> what would you do during a zombie apocalypse? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> what would you do during a zombie apocalypse? <sighs> well, my husband is a police officer and a trained gun expert. So I think I would just kind of hide behind him <laughs> <laughs> and let him do all the killing and all the shooting and, you know, kind of follow the path that he created for us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like uh, Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah. Yep. He's the leader and I just follow. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have a favorite TV show that you're watching right now? Um, so I like, um, crime and murder mysteries and stuff like that. So, um, right now my favorite TV show is a, a show in the States called Chicago PD. Um, and it's a group of, uh, police officers and how they handle crime in the city of Chicago. So that's my favorite show right now. Okay, great. When was the last time you laughed so hard that like your stomach hurt? Honestly, every day or just about every day. Um, my kids are like, I'm telling you, my son, he is a different kid. He's a character and he makes us laugh. Um, <laughs> he's probably going to be mad when he gets older. So yesterday um, we're on vacation. We're at my mom's house in the country and um, she went into the bathroom and the floor is wet. So she's like, okay, someone is playing in the water in the bathroom which one of you guys are playing in the water and they both are like it's not me it's not me so my mom's like okay if you guys don't tell me the truth and tell me who is playing in the water in the bathroom you're both gonna get in trouble and you're gonna be on punishment for the rest of the weekend so my son apparently has been intentionally not aiming for the toilet when he's going to the bathroom and aiming for the trash can and he's been <laughs> peeing in the trash can <laughs> I laughed so hard. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, I'm like it's not funny. I'm like, well, Bob, it kind of is. Like, why would he be in the dress kit? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's like on a daily basis. He does something, and I'm just like, why did you think that that was okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, kids kids are something else, right? They just definitely light up our lives. Oh gosh. I'm telling you, he's a character. What were well, the top lessons you've learned in life so far? <clears throat> Love myself above everyone else. Um, I don't have to please other people as long as I please myself. And it's not my job to change other people's perception of me. I love all those. Love them. Do you have any regrets? I want to say yes. I want to say that I regret being with the father of my children, but then I wouldn't have my children. Um, so because of them, no. Okay. <clears throat> um, what advice has maybe one of your family members given you that has really helped you out? Oh, my mom's favorite saying is major in the minors. And when she said that to me, 
I didn't get it at first. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And she was like, you know, major in the majors and minors in the minors. And I'm just like, you're speaking gibberish right now. Um, but what it means is you don't have to make a big deal about stuff that's not a big deal, right? When we make a big deal about stuff that's a big deal and stuff that's kind of like, oh, whatever, just uh, whatever, and just keep it pushing. And I use that in my day to day. I use it with my husband. I use it with my kids. I use it with, you know, everything that I do. Um, for instance, um, if my kids don't want to get dressed and they just want to wear their pajamas all day long, fine, wear your pajamas all day long. I don't care. Like, that's not going to kill anyone. Um, if they don't want to eat their food, fine. You don't have to eat all day. Just don't touch the snacks. Until you eat a full course meal, you guys can't have any snacks for the day, you know? And it's just like, only make a big deal about stuff that's worth making a big deal about. And stuff that's not, just let it go. Major in the minors. I like that. Major in the minors. Okay, cool. Um, do you have, like, uh, something you would like to offer the audience today or a gift? So I am going to put my book, um, my post trauma healing, the six steps to overcoming your trauma. I'm going to put the book in the chat. Um, I would love everybody to read it. Um, if you guys want to give me feedback about it or review it, I would be ecstatic about that. Um, but that is going to be my gift to you guys. I am going to put the book in the, the chat, the link to the book in the chat so that you guys can read it. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Well, I don't have any more questions for you today. It's been a very great uh, chat. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've gotten really to know you and I, you are definitely inspiring from uh, what you have overcome and how you're trying to help uh, young kids and adults. And you're, you're just an inspiration, Krishna. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me on this call. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a great rest of the Sunday. Thank you, you too. Thanks. Bye.